Hi everyone, this is Divine Harmony, and yes, my real name is Harmony. I am an astrologer, a writer, a teacher, a mythologist, a mother, actually that should be number one, <laughs> and I'm here to share a video with you on Nadia's YouTube channel. She was so gracious and um, thoughtful to reach out and ask if I wanted to share something with you all, and I am actually very excited to do so, so thank you so much, Nadia, for your graciousness and your generosity. So I want to talk about the Capricorn Confluence, which is what I'm calling all the Capricorn that's going on this year in 2019, but actually is a part of a trilogy of years, starting with last year, 2018, this year, 2019, moving into 2020. We have all this stuff going on in Capricorn. And essentially in 2018, we had Saturn move into Capricorn. We had Pluto conjunct his own south node. So if you know about the nodes of the moon, north node, south node, destiny, karma, every planet has their own nodes. And Pluto was on his own south node last October of 2018. We also had Mars retrograde in the two signs ruled by Saturn, Aquarius and Capricorn. And then we have the south node move into Capricorn in November. This year, we had Pluto on the south node just a week ago, as I'm recording. We're heading to Saturn on the south node, and then we're having three eclipses on the south node. And the next year, we have Saturn conjunct Pluto and Capricorn, and the end of this year, actually, Jupiter moves in Capricorn. So Capricorn is like all over the place. You know, this is the sign of the CEO the business person, the great father. It's one of the two guru planets, and so it's also a great teacher. At its best, Capricorn is about structure, foundation, integrity, responsibility, hard work, accountability. But the shadow of Capricorn, and that's massively magnified, particularly this year because of all the karmic south node conjunctions, Pluto and Saturn, it's really illuminating what's out of balance with Capricorn. Where are we rigid? Where are we controlling? Where are we dogmatic? Where are we doing things out of fear or out of a fear for safety and security? So we're holding on to the old, holding on to the past, resisting change, resisting transformation. Where are there things we've always done that are actually no longer good for us? maybe have never been good for us, but we were told, oh, this is what everybody does. This is what women do. This is what men do. This is what families do. This is what whatever country you're from, that's what these people do. And, you know, this is really a year to question all of that. It's a big year for facing shadow. And I'll talk about that more towards the end of the video. But shadow is, you know, that which we have within ourselves, everybody has light and shadow, but we have this desire not to see our own shadow. And so we project it out onto others. It creates division, it creates war, it creates all kinds of problems. And the karmic south node is a point of shadow. It is a point of where we can be stuck, where we can do things over and over, get stuck in an old paradigm, resist change, default to what's easy, but is not necessarily what's good or healthy. And that is up big time this year. We're really being asked to look at that. So we've got this trilogy of years, 2018 to 2020, with so much Capricorn. And then I just want to focus on this year and a little bit on next year in this video. You know, what's going on now and what's going forward. So 2019 started off <laughs> January 1st with a Sun-Saturn conjunction in Capricorn. I mean, talk about symbolism, right? It's like a big year focused on Capricorn and the karma around Capricorn that we're needing to work with and through. And the first day of the year starts off in a very powerful Saturnine way. At best, this was a year that opened up about getting real, getting masterful, facing what needs to be faced. But the shadow side is it's also more entrenched. It's like, oh, it's just so much easier to do what we've always done or to default to the powers that be or, um, you know, give away our power to authority figures. Capricorn is very much about authority and how we reference authority. You know, is authority coming from our ego self? Is authority coming from our wounded child that's running the whole ship and so we're acting out of wounding and conditioning? 
is authority externally referenced. So we see it out in everyone else and we project our authority onto celebrities, onto spiritual teachers, onto um, you know, political figures. Or do we have a self-reference for authority? Do we have a healthy relationship to what it means to have authority? And not just like the power and the control that can come with authority, but the responsibility, the accountability, you know, to really be an authority figure. It's not about power and control. It's about accountability, responsibility, integrity. That's what it is in its highest manifestation. And so this is a, a thread this year. So 2019 started off with a Sun-Saturn conjunction. Then we had Pluto on the South Node. There's two variations of the node, mean and true. I track them both. I find them both useful. So mean was March 28th, true was April 4th. What was exceptionally potent about the true conjunction, it was in the dark of the moon. And the dark moon is already the end of a cycle. It's about purging, releasing, completing, you know, turning within, facing the shadow. And Pluto's south node is right smack in the middle of all that. We also had Eris square the nodes, mean and true, uh, March 20th, which was the equinox and April 2nd. And so April 2nd through 4th, very tight trigger by the nodes of Pluto and Eris, who are going to be square each other next year. We'll talk about that in a moment. And um, then we have Pluto and Saturn stationing retrograde end of April. So slowing down, coming to a stop close to the south node, energizing that karmic, you know, south node energy and all those, the Pluto and Saturn conjunctions to the south node. When planets are stationary, they're at their most powerful, and positively and negatively. So Pluto, you know, shining a light on the shadow, transformation, empowerment, but then the shadow, power control dynamics, power over power under, who's trying to maintain power at any cost? Are there power struggles in your life? And if there are, how are you navigating them? Saturn, the Lord of Karma and the Father of Time, He's magnifying what's karmic, what's stagnant, what's stuck, what's no longer working. Where are we crystallized? Where are we rigid? Where are we resisting change? And Saturn is highlighting that hugely. Then we head into the Saturn South Node conjunctions. There's three. And as I said, there's mean and true nodes. So I'm going to give you the dates for all of them. For mean nodes, the first one is May 20th. June 23rd, September 15th. And that September 15th one's big because just three days later, Saturn stations direct. So we have a stationary Saturn on the south node in September. True variation of the node. We've got April 30th for the first one, July 3rd, and then September 27th. So essentially from the end of April until September, we have three Saturn south node conjunctions. Saturn is in Capricorn, the sign he rules. He's on the south node in Capricorn, so he rules the south node. So we have a massively potent Saturnine Capricorn south node energy. And south node, yes, there's gifts in the south node. There definitely is because this is about the past. It's what you bring forward with you. But it's also about the karma. It's about the parts of the past that didn't get resolved properly, that didn't get fully dealt with. And so then they're being brought forth into this lifetime, if you believe in reincarnation, or just even in this time of, in your life, and it's needing to be worked with. So Saturn on the South Node is a massive call to deal with what's karmic, what's stagnant, stuck, um, what's old paradigm, where we are rigid, where we are moralistic, where we are authoritarian, where we are fundamentalistic, if that's even a word, I just sort of made it up. You know, where we think we're right and everybody else is wrong and everyone just needs to listen and we bear down and try and be in control, you know, and this is different for everybody based on your chart. Towards the end of the video, I'll give a little cheat sheet for the signs, um, you know, so listen for that towards the end. But it's big, and the thing with Saturn, he gets a bad rap. I love Saturn, actually, but I don't actually, so I have an unaspected Saturn in my chart. If you make wide orbs, he does make a couple aspects, but if you're looking at like kind of tighter um, 
succinct orbs, I have zero aspects to my Saturn. So when you have an unaspected planet, there's a whole journey of learning how to work with it, how to relate to it, because it's sort of like floating out there by itself. And I'm Pisces rising, and I have tons of Neptune, and I'm very watery. So Saturn, of course, is a very different principle than that. You know, Saturn's the container of the water. Um, Saturn's about reality as opposed to mystical things that Pisces is more into. But Saturn is an esoteric sign, and it's a sign of the spiritual initiate. Actually, Jesus was born when the sun was in Capricorn, ruled by Saturn, and so were many other sons of God who died and were reborn. Mythologically, there's a lot of um, initiates and high spiritual teachers that come into embodiment uh, when they're, you know, the sun is transiting through Capricorn. So there's a deeply esoteric quality to Capricorn. And I had to journey with learning how to work with Saturn. I love him now, but initially, you know, I didn't understand him. But now I deeply do. And so Saturn on the south node, when you work with him, when you're willing to show up to do the work, be in integrity, face your shadow, deal with the crap that's stuck and stagnant and holding you back from the evolution you seek, when you move towards your resistance instead of, you know, wanting to run away from it and escape and deny and deny and, you know, just pretend things aren't happening or just whatever, you know, not really deal, but you show up to deal with integrity and mastery. It's amazing what Saturn can help you do. You know, Saturn can help you pull gifts from the past and bring them fully into manifestation, into embodiment, into, into this life, into this part of your lifetime. So he's not all bad, and it's really important to understand that. And, you know, he is the teacher, the great teacher, two teachers, Jupiter and Saturn. And Jupiter teaches more by expansion, abundance, opportunity, luck. And Saturn teaches by contraction, reality, karma. And I really feel like the lesson with Saturn is learning how to find expansion in the contraction, to find the capacity to shine and be creative in the midst of limitation, to not allow the limits to squash you, but to have them create boundaries within which you allow yourself to be free and creative. Like that is, that is Saturn in, in my you know, understanding. So we have Saturn in the South Node, and then we have three south node eclipses. So we have a partial solar eclipse in Capricorn, January 5th already happened. We've got another uh, partial lunar eclipse coming up July 16th in Capricorn. And then we have a partial solar eclipse on Christmas Day for those who celebrate December 25th. So three south node eclipses, Saturn on the south node, Pluto on the south node, south node in Capricorn. So, I mean, really the spotlight is on Capricorn. You know, I've been telling people in my column, I do horoscopes uh, weekly and monthly, how where Capricorn is in your chart is where the biggest karma is and the biggest lessons are, but also the most massive capacity for self-mastery, for evolution, for spiritual maturity, for growing up. It's all happening where Capricorn is in your chart. Again, towards the end of the video, I'm going to give you a little cheat sheet for the signs. One other thing to be aware of is the Venus dance uh, this year is totally tied into um, Capricorn as well, especially Pluto in Capricorn. So the Venus-Pluto dance, her morning star began on November 1st during Scorpio season, but her interior conjunction, or rather her conjunction, was October 26th, Sun-Venus conjunction in Scorpio, the sign of Pluto. And then June 27th, she'll have her heliacal set, and she sets in Gemini exactly quincunx Pluto in Capricorn. Then August 13th, she makes her exterior conjunction, Sun-Venus conjunction at 22 Leo, exactly quincunx Pluto in Capricorn. And then October 1st, her heliacal rise is at 21 Libra. And the days, the two days leading up to that, we have the Moon-Venus conjunction squaring Pluto, and then we have Pluto stationing direct October 2nd. So Venus, her, her um, setting and going into the underworld, her rising, her in conjunction in the underworld, her rising are all tied into Pluto. So I'm seeing this huge theme of Venus, the divine feminine. Everybody has a feminine side, so this is not just about women. We are all 
whole beings with a masculine side and a feminine side. And the journey is integration. The journey truly is integration. Typically, we are, it's one of the qualities is easier for us, whether it's easier, the feminine receptivity, compassion, relational quality, easier. Or maybe it's easier for us to be independent, doing our own thing, going after what we want and need. But we want to have access to both. That's what wholeness is. And Venus in her journey with all this Pluto action, to me, she has a massive year of transformation around our relationship to the feminine. And if you add in the fact that the North Node is in Cancer, the sign of the Divine Mother, and that's actually the point opposite of Pluto too, in evolutionary astrology, the, the sign and specifically degree opposite Pluto is really important for the evolutionary impetus. And so it's Cancer. <laughs> and so we got Cancer, Moon energy, Venus, divine feminine energy, really in a state of transformation this year in all of us, men and women on the planet. You know, it'll, it'll be interesting actually to see all the news and how it unfolds. So Capricorn, you know, there's the positive side of Capricorn and there's the shadow side. And I talked about it a little bit. So, you know, Capricorn is about power and control. How do we wield it? Especially Pluto and Capricorn, by the way, power and control. But even, you know, without the Pluto piece, it's how do we wield power? You know, ultimately the journey, especially with Pluto and Capricorn, is to be centered in our power. So we don't give away our power and play the victim. We don't lord our power over others and play the tyrant. Victim, tyrant, two ends of the spectrum. We want to come into balanced you know, relationship with power so that we're standing in our power and we're not doing it as a way to control everybody else. We're also not trying to control ourselves. We're actually coming into self-mastery, ultimately, is what it's about. So that's a big part of Capricorn. And so is authority, as I mentioned before. How are we referencing authority? Are we coming from the ego? Are we coming from the wounded inner child? Are we projecting our power out in authority outwards? Or are we really anchoring into it, you know, in an embodied way with integrity? Um, Capricorn is also about dogma and rigidity. It's, it governs structures and foundations, what's enduring, what's lasted through time, but also what has become oppressive and rigid and static. You know, um, in, in science, stasis is the precursor to death. Like all things change. All things are in a state of flux, whether on a macro or micro level. And so the moment something crystallizes and becomes static and rigid and unmoving, that is a warning sign that you know, either something's going to die or something needs to explode to get us to realize things need to shift and change. Things need to evolve. Old things need to die. New things need to be born. Capricorn governs big business, the government, patriarchy, corporations. So all of these things are up big time. Where are they out of balance? Where is um, the choices we've made as, as countries, as a humanity, not working for everyone, not working for the planet, <laughs> you know, not working for the environment and the health of it and the vitality. And also Capricorn rules fear and karma, which I've mentioned, and even depression. So, you know, especially when these aspects are more exact, if you're really feeling a heaviness, just know that that's a, a part of the astrology and honor it and give yourself what you need. You know, typically you need inward time and focus. You need to disconnect from things that you use to escape with or, um, you know, check out with and really drop down and in and be like, okay, what's going on at the foundational level that's needing my attention, that's needing my presence. And that is going to be really important this year. You know, the light side of Capricorn is mastery, integrity, accountability, responsibility, you know, the emperor card in the tarot is, is not, not ruled by Capricorn, it's actually Aries, but it has a Capricorn energy, a Saturn energy, if you will, because it's, it's very, you know, the great father kind of archetype. It's very, I'm here and I'm responsible and I'm going to deal with things. And that's, you know, a positive side of Capricorn. Uh, for me, Capricorn leaders who have integrity and mastery and accountability and a desire to be of service 
are the leaders we want and need. And that is gonna be so important this year and even next year with the big astrology that is incoming. We cannot be in it for the power and the control. You know, those who are in it for that, those who are in it to manipulate, to, um, you know, uh, control the masses or have all the money or have all the resources, that's, that's going to um, not be a good path to be going down <laughs> this year, next year. Um, also, Shadow Capricorn is where we're doing, and this is like disempowered Shadow Capricorn, so it's where we do what we're told, what's expected, what's obligated. So again, giving away the power, not following our heart doing things because of fear, doing things because this is the practical thing to do for safety, for security, to make money, even though it doesn't feed my soul and fulfill my heart. Um, Shadow Capricorn is when we focus on safety and security and money and power and control at the expense of our higher self and of our true calling and purpose. And, you know, Shadow Capricorn is actually not about passion. It's about logic. It's about reality. It's about what I should be doing or what's the right thing to do. But if that's disconnected from the heart, that's a problem, you know, and that's where all this beautiful Venus and the North Node and Cancer come in because that's about being connected to the heart and to the feminine and to inclusivity and to others, you know, to just be aware of others and how actions I take impact others, you know, those around me, but also in the world and other creatures and the environment, all of it. So we're heading into the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which is next year. And this year is kind of preparing us for that. And, you know, that's kind of like a whole other video, to be honest. But that one's huge because it's going to be conjunct series, The Great Mother. And for me, it's really going to be about a call for leaders who serve Mother Earth, who serve the planet, who are aware of what's going on and the trajectory we're headed on and what needs to change. We need leaders with integrity. We need leaders who are as committed, if not more, to their own inner work, psychological, emotional, spiritual, so that we know that it's not just about them out there in the world, controlling things, doing, you know, being in power, but they have done that journey down and in, and they have faced their shadow and continue to do so. And they are exploring their inner world and they are dealing with their dogmas and their rigidity and their anger, rage, or their grief and sadness so that it's not getting projected out and then creates all kinds of fun experiences, but it's really being worked with on a deep level. Those are the people we want to lead us. And that is going to be so important in the years to come. So we need leaders with heart and compassion and empathy but also very good boundaries, you know, masters, like people who have learned the mastery of the material world, um, but have stayed deeply connected to their heart and to their compassion. And of course, this is not about perfection either, because that can be a shadow side of Capricorn and Saturn is looking for the perfect thing. It's got to be fluid. It's got to be organic. But there is a big call to up-level leadership in our world. And I feel like that's a big piece of what's incoming. The other thing I wanted to mention is the Pluto Eris square. So end of March, early April, we had the nodes trigger Pluto and Eris. We don't have the exact Pluto Eris square until January. I think it's January 26th is the first one and it goes through 2021. And this is huge. This is the second activation of Eris since she was discovered in 2005. She's the new archetype. So every Every century, a new body has been discovered, and it's totally showing us um, the energy of what's incoming in that century. So, you know, new discoveries in the solar system mirror where we are as a collective. So in the 18th century, Uranus was discovered, and that's the Industrial Revolution, and we started having a lot of technological developments. Um, Neptune was discovered in the 19th century. That was the dawn of spiritualism, occultism, also pharmaceutical drugs. All of this is governed by Neptune. Pluto in the 20th century, depth psychology, Freud, Jung, but also the nuclear bomb and nuclear power, which is governed by Pluto. And now in the 21st century, we've got Eris. Eris was discovered. So what's waking up in the collective right now? Well, this is the solar feminine. This is the warrior goddess. She gets a bad rap, first of all. Her contemporary myth you hear is a very patriarchal rewrite. Yes, she has a shadow side. Everything does. Even the sun, Venus, and Jupiter 
have a shadow side. So her shadow side, she's the goddess of discord and chaos. She's the goddess of upheaval. She exposes what's in the shadow that no one wants to see. She comes in and turns the apple cart upside down. But she also reveals the very chaos and upheaval that needs to be seen, that needs to be known. She shines a light on the shadow. She actually is almost like, you know, what is that movie? Um, oh my gosh, it's, I'm spacing on it now. The one with... Um, Dorothy and the dog, Wizard of Oz. So Eris would be like the one who comes and opens up the curtain and reveals who's controlling everything behind the scenes. That's Eris, right? That was a chaotic, you know, kind of revelation, but look where that led things. Like it, it's seeing the truth. She's really a warrior for truth and she wants everyone to see the truth and know the truth and live the truth. And then that makes me think of that other movie that I'm not going to remember the title of where he says, you want the truth, you can't handle the truth. So many of us on the planet seem to not be able to handle the truth. And we prefer illusions, deception, lies, escapism, you know, anything to not really see what's going on first and foremost inside, but also externally in the world around us. So Eris is this solar feminine archetype that's so amazing that's coming in that can really help shift the trajectory that we are on as, you know, as a, as a humanity. Solar feminine is different than lunar feminine. So lunar is the moon, right? Receptive, surrendering, hidden, um, you know, softer. Solar feminine is the female sun goddess. You know, she's not you know, reflecting anybody else's light. She is her own light. She is a warrior. She's fierce. She's powerful. She's not that the lunar goddess isn't fierce or powerful, but it's a different kind of power. It's a, a softer power. It's a surrendering power. It's a behind the scenes power, whereas solar feminine is boom, right in front of us. So she's a warrior for truth and she can fight the established authority. And that would be the shadow of Capricorn. And so here you can see some powerful astrology that is incoming. So her medicine's potent and it's only getting going. You know, uh, June 2016 to spring 2017 was our first major outer planetary activation of Eris by Uranus. Now the second activation is Pluto from 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021. And then Chiron will trigger her, and then Neptune will trigger her. So then we're going to have all the outer planets, plus Chiron, the Rainbow Bridge, triggering this new archetype, really massively bringing into consciousness what she is, what she's about, and why she's here, you know, and what she has to teach us. Um, one thing I did want to mention really quick is that what's amazing this year in the astrology is we have a Saturn-Neptune uh, sextile. So yeah, there's the Capricorn confluence. Yeah, that's where there's karma, where we need to deal with stuff. But we do have Saturn linking with Neptune. Saturn is the root chakra. Neptune is the crown chakra. Saturn's in his rulership of Capricorn. Neptune's in his rulership of Pisces. These are two traditionally very mystical signs. I mean, we've kind of gotten the mystical part of Capricorn lopped off. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is the sign of the spiritual initiate of the sons of God, and it's deeply mystical. It's just we kind of need to get back in touch with that, I guess. Pisces still has very much retained its mysticism. And when we have these two linked in a harmonious aspect, there's huge potential for bridging root with crown, <laughs> material reality with spirituality. Like this is an amazing aspect for taking our dreams and visions and bringing them into manifestation to really do the work of material as well as spiritual mastery in balanced ways. You know, only material mastery without the spiritual awareness is a problem. <laughs> and then, you know, only spiritual mastery without being in the material world and, and being grounded is also, you know, imbalance. We want to have both. And this aspect is quite profound for that. And we can really work with it. So for me, this year is a year to work with the shadow. And I'm actually going to have a course in May about shadow and astrology. Astrology and your shadow. I'm going to be teaching about shadow work and about um, Jungian psychology and how you can see the aspects of the psyche according to Jung, persona, ego, id, all of that in the chart. And then I'm going to talk about how to see the shadow in the chart, and then we're going to have exercises on how to work with it. So we'll be going over stuff like shadow, 
pain, conditioning, um, emotions, how to work with them, the inner child, the anima and animus, the inner marriage of the masculine and feminine. I'm super excited about it. This is These are my two passions, astrology and shadow work. So um, if you want more information, just look in the... Um, underneath the video and the little link and there's a, a link there um, that you can get more info and sign up if you're interested. So last but not least, I just wanted to share with you just a brief little thing about where this Capricorn confluence is for you based on your sign. So listen for sun sign and rising sign. This is not an exhaustive list, but I'm just sharing little brief tidbits for you. So for Aries, it's in your 10th house of career, life, purpose, and calling, and you're going through a massive karmic purging around an old identity professionally, what you've been doing in the world, radically transforming and changing. It's a time to let go of what is toxic, stagnant, stuck, especially any authority figures you've been working with or for that are out of integrity or they're not in alignment with your values. This is a huge call to release and open up to the new. Taurus, it's in your ninth house of higher self, higher mind, beliefs, and attitudes. This is a call to question what you believe in, to question your dogma, beliefs that have been passed down to you from family, from culture. This is a time to open your mind, come back to beginner's mind, and start seeing from a whole new perspective. Gemini, it's in your eighth house of shadow dancing and transformation. This is the Pluto house, the Scorpio house. And this is all about the taboo topics of society, sex, death, money, power, control, the things people are afraid of or obsessed with, eighth house rules them. And so this is about facing your fears, facing your obsessions, and doing the deep inner work. Cancer, it's in your seventh house of relationship. Massive karmic clearing around partnerships and relationships of all kinds. There could be huge endings going on in your life. Divorces, separations, ending of business partnerships. But it's also, and more importantly, about patterns that you've been playing out for who knows how many lifetimes in relationship, especially any patterns around parent-child dynamic, either you being the child looking for a parent to take care of you, or you being the parent, always parenting people's inner child, but then not relating on a place of equality. Now, for Leo, it's in your sixth house of work, service, and health. Radical purging and clearing of old ways of showing up in your everyday life, in your routines, in your organization and efficiency or lack thereof, in your health and well-being. You know, sometimes you can be a sign that thinks like, oh, I'm fine. Nothing can take me down. I can just output tons of energy and I don't need to rest and relax and restore. And then your body talks. And so this is not a time to do that. You want to give yourself time to retreat, to reflect, to honor your body and your health and your well-being. For Virgo, it's in your fifth house of romance, creativity, self-expression, fun. You know, what's interesting about this house, this is the house that's like the fun house. And you got Capricorn there and Capricorn's about responsibility. So where do you limit yourself from pursuing what you really love and desire? Where do you hold back your creativity or your full radiance and do what's expected? And where are you ready to blast through that? Where are you ready to have more fun in life and go after what you love? Libra, it's in your fourth house of home, family, roots, and foundation. So this is about massive stuff coming up around childhood, around where you live and reside, your roots, your foundations. It's even past lifetimes, this house, really doing deep work around the past and how it like influences your capacity to be in the present is so, so key. For Scorpio, it's in your third house of communication. So this is radical transformation around your mind, how you think, how you perceive, and how you create your reality. Where is your mind rigid, dogmatic, limited? Where do you hold yourself back, not fully express yourself, not fully put yourself out there? Where does a change of mind need to happen? For Sagittarius, it's in your second house of money, values, and self-worth. So radical shift and purging around old ways of relating to the material world, either hoarding money or having fear about not having enough, holding on to things forever and never letting them go. And this is the house of self-worth and self-love. So this is about finding a deeper source of both so that they're not attached to your bank account, what you own, what you drive, what you look like, or any of those things, but it's really deeply sourced from within. For Capricorn, it's in your first house of self. You're going through 
the most massive transformation of your lifetime and maybe lifetimes. <laughs> and this is all about letting go of an old persona, an old way of meeting the world, especially the shadow of Capricorn, rigidity, walls instead of boundaries, dogma, fear, power and control. You're going through the most massive transformation to date, but it's hard, you know, to release what's always been, what we've always done. We have neural pathways in our brain and we kind of just default to the old neural pathways. This is requiring that you create new ones. Not easy, but worth it. Aquarius, it's in your 12th house of the unconscious and spirituality. This is a great house for the spirit. It's probably one of the least favorite houses for the ego because it's the house of surrender. Ego doesn't like to surrender. It's also the house of loss and it's one of the houses of karma. And so here you're needing to face your own unconscious around Capricorn, around power, control, and authority. Are you afraid of having power? Are you afraid of being in control or, or being in a position of authority? Or could you be obsessed with power and control, but you're not aware of it? You're not conscious of it and you don't think so. And your conscious self doesn't uh, identify with that. But there's something going on behind the scenes that really needs to be looked at and addressed. Great time to pay attention to your dreams, actually. A lot of dreams can come through with 12th house transits. And then last but not least, Pisces. It's in your 11th house of friendship, community, hopes, and dreams. And this is a massive purge of your social network. Completing friendships that are no longer in alignment with you. Letting go of communities you've been involved with that are no longer you know, where you're needing to go. Especially wherever you've been so wrapped up in community and we consciousness, but then that's been blocking you from really stepping out and shining as a leader. That is what you're needing to purge and release and let go of this year. So that is the cheat sheet, little nutshell for through the signs for all the Capricorn. I hope you enjoy this video. I had a lot of fun recording it. And feel free to visit my website, divineharmony.com, if you want to read more of my content or hear things that I post. And also, if you're interested in the astrology and your shadow course, down in the bio of this video, there should be a link. And you can click on it, learn more about it, and sign up. I hope to see you sometime online or in person. And thank you so much to Nadia for having me on your channel. Many blessings.